Okay, so where we left off from last time, I did very minor tweaking just to like scale stuff and change the proportions just to make it look a little bit nicer. Um, nothing that I didn't show off in the last one, but just, you know, cutting out some of the boring bits of just selecting and scaling and selecting and scaling to make it look less, you know, twig-like on the sides. Um, this is basically where we left off. So we have the model. Um, this is the high poly version of the model, so if I go into wireframe view, you can see very high density because we're using we're still using the subdivision modifier to give it a lot more extra detail. So our actual model underneath is very low polygon, easy to work with, and then we're smoothing it up so it looks. Oh, come on, switch to solid view. There we go. So we go from that looks really terrible to that looks pretty good. Um, and I like using the subdivision workflow because it it means you're not working with a million polygons when you're trying to do basic editing, um, and you can up smooth to the kind of quality you want. So if you were doing models for like uh, Hollywood VFX quality and you're going to get really close to them, this is pretty much perfectly fine because for something like that, you're going to be rendering on a graphics card. It's going to take several minutes per frame. Um, you don't have to worry too much about the optimization of the model. So right now with four levels of subdivision, you can see down at the bottom of the screen, bottom right, it tells you the information for your scene. So this thing has... I'm oh, sorry? Oh. Uh, is that a little better? Put it closer to my mouth. Testing. Uh, okay. I'll move it closer to my mouth and see. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically what I was saying, we have a very high polygon mesh here, which would be perfectly fine for like a Hollywood VFX shot because it doesn't really matter how many polygons you're using for something that's going to take several minutes to render per frame anyway. Um, and you get scene information in the bottom right of your screen in Blender. So down here you can see it says we've got about half a million faces, half a million vertices, about a million triangles. Um, and the triangles is what you really worry about because um, basically what any 3D software will do before sending it to your graphics card is turn it into triangles because triangles are really efficient for a uh, graphics card to render. So any squares, it will basically cut it in half like you know, cutting a piece of toast in half and turning it into triangles. Um, now, a million faces for a Hollywood thing, not too bad. If we were to send this to, like, a game engine, though, where you're trying to render at 60 or more frames a second, a million, million polygons is a big problem, because for most modern game engines, at least right now with our current hardware, you're talking about one to five million triangles that are allowed on the entire screen at once, which means if you've got a big open world game like GTA or something, and you've got cars and pedestrians and buildings and signs and light posts, that million triangles can either go to one really high quality fire hydrant or, you know, all of the objects in the scene. Um, so the workflow for getting something that looks really nice for rendering really fast is you start with something high polygon, really sharp, really crisp, how you want it to look, and then we're going to turn it into something, and I kind of pre-prepared this earlier, very low polygon. So this is now down to um, under 8,000, 7,500 polygons, which is perfectly fine for a single close-up object. Um, and what we're going to do is take the details from our high one, nice, smooth, sharp, and then bake them down onto a low polygon one. Um, and to slightly explain this, so we kind of covered this last time a little bit. If I go to, uh, I'm pressing, you can either go to the object menu and you've got a bunch of options, shade flat, shade smooth, or if I hit W, uh, like Walrus, it pulls up a little special menu, and I can switch between flat shading and smooth shading. So with flat shading, you can see all of the individual faces that actually make up the model, and it looks like, I don't know, crystal, where it's been really cut flat, um, really jagged. Looks pretty awful. And then we have smooth shading, where it kind of rounds off the surfaces and tells the lighting to treat the surface differently than the underlying faces. And so that's kind of what we're doing 
when we bake down the details from a high polygon model down to a low polygon model, except we're not just going to smooth everything evenly, we're actually going to smooth it by taking the details from one and moving it to the other. And so to give a little bit of a, a demonstration of the idea, wah, let's create a new whiteboard. Just going to do like quick doodle drawings of the math and the idea behind what we're doing. So in 3D, you have vertices, which are the little points that connect between faces. You have edges that connect between those vertices on the faces. And then if you had, whoa, if you had four vertices and four edges connecting to each other, you'd have a square face. And obviously the GPU would cut that in half into two triangular faces. And so as far as lighting is concerned, kind of going back to basic high, high school physics kind of stuff, um, if you have a flat face, there is a, a, a property of a flat face called the normal. The normal is basically the direction... Wow, if I could draw, that would be so much better. Basically, a normal is the direction perfectly 90 degrees perpendicular to the surface. So it tells you kind of which way the surface is facing. And so if you had a little happy sunshine, if you have a beam of light coming into a surface and reflecting off of it like a mirror, you've got the angles, and the angle that it comes in at, the angle of incidence, is exactly equal to the angle of reflection. So it bounces at perfectly even angles. Which means that if we have a sphere in 3D, which is going to be really low polygon, so let's bottle this like an octagon, an octagonal face for, for a um, sphere. If we're in like the flat shaded mode, you can see, eh, not smooth shaded, flat shaded, that looks really hideous and awful, and you can see the individual faces. But what we can do is fake the normals. Let's go back to the whiteboard. So you can imagine each face has a single normal pointing directly off of each face. And so the reflections would be very flat and very angular. But we, what we want to do is approximate these really jagged edges as being a nice, flowing, smooth, like circular face. And so what we're going to do is use a texture that fakes really smooth normals in between all of the faces and fakes that it's actually a round surface underneath instead of flat surfaces underneath. And more than that, because we have a nice high polygon where we have a bunch of polygons with a bunch of normals, and then we're going to make a low polygon, we can actually take the details from one and like project them onto the other to make it look like the first one. So the process I did, you have the Holly Polygon, you duplicate it. In Blender, it's Shift and then D as in dog to duplicate. And I'm going to right click so I don't actually move it anywhere. So these are actually two objects that are literally stacked right one on top of the other. So if I grabbed one, you could see it's there are two, but they're sitting right on top of each other. And what I'm going to do on the second one is turn off the modifier. And so on the second one, now all of the smoothing is turned off, and all of our faces are really turned off. And it's really flat. But because we were modeling so low polygon, I'm actually going to undo that. I'm actually going to go to like one level of subdivision and then hit apply. And so it's still kind of jagged but it's not quite as jagged. So some of the smooth edges look a little bit more rounded than like, uh, this would have been like a, a six-sided face, and now it's like 12 sides, which looks a little bit more smooth. Still pretty well optimized for games, um, but a little bit smoother. And then the only thing I did between um, last class and this class is um, because I did that one level of smoothing, there are some like useless edges, like this edge here, the bolt is completely flat, there's no point to have an edge here, and the front of the bolt is supposed to be completely flat, so why do we have three edges here? And so I literally just went through and used 
uh, delete, delete is x for delete, and hit dissolve edges. And what dissolve does is if I were to actually delete the edges, the edges would go away, the faces would go away, and everything would be deleted. If I dissolve, it removes the edges but keeps the underlying surface in place. So literally all I did is go through and dissolve and start selecting and dissolving useless edges that don't actually contribute to the shape. They're just extra edges. Oops. And then turned it from our high polygon into this one where all the useless edges are, give, are destroyed and we're just left with kind of the useful edges. So if anybody's watching the archive later or um, joining into the class, I did actually pre-prepare this and it's in the Google Drive folder. Um, I believe you downloaded it already. So this is where we're going to be picking up from, um, where we have a low polygon and a high polygon. So I'll delete the duplicate I just made to demonstrate and these are the two we're going to be working with. I'm going to leave it in smooth shading mode just so it looks a little bit nicer. And so now we have two. So the high polygon one, if you double click in your collections, you can actually rename stuff. So I could name this literally everything, anything. The high polygon one, I named fire hydrant underscore high for high poly. Then I hit it and show the other one and name this one fire hydrant underscore low, just to uh, indicate which one is which. And this is going to be important for when we go to actually baking our model later, when we export the model from Blender to Marmoset Toolbag, it will automatically find objects that are named high, that share the same name with underscore high and low, and then separate them so it knows to bake the high details onto the low details, so it does all that stuff automatically for us, which is really nice and convenient. So the high and low naming convention is pretty much industry standard for anybody working on like this kind of game engine workflow of, of high poly to low poly. So now that we have a low polygon mesh, and literally all I did, as I said, is I disabled the uh, subdivision modifier and just deleted useless edges until I had something nice and clean. Um, I did go ahead and get rid of the indentations on the base here because we're actually going to demonstrate on here that you can actually bake in details um, such as these indentations onto a flat surface and it won't um, you won't really be able to tell by the end. Um, as far as like a good rule of thumb when you are um, baking down details from high poly to low poly, if the geometry on the surface doesn't actually contribute anything to the um, the silhouette of the object. Like you can see, I kept the bolts on the surface because the bolts affect the silhouette of the object. If the bolts weren't here, like if I removed that, the silhouette would definitely change. Um, but when it comes to like the indentations on the surface, if I'm looking at it from the front, Basically, even though there are indentations going into the surface, it still just looks like a cylinder as far as the silhouette is concerned. So it doesn't affect the silhouette. It doesn't need to be represented with actual physical geometry. So now that we have the, the 3D model, we've got a low polygon version. Um, the only thing we need to do before we can actually bake the details down is to actually bake things onto textures and texture surface. Obviously, this is a 3D model and textures are images, which are 2D. So a photograph is obviously two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. So how do you go from a two-dimensional thing and then put it on something that actually exists in 3D space? Well, basically you think of it like a bearskin rug or unwrapping um, or folding together like a cardboard box into a box. The way that it folds apart shows you how to take something 3D and unfold it into something 2D. And so the process is called UV unwrapping. Um, and the reason it's called UV is because we're already using X, Y, and Z coordinates for our 3D view. And so instead of calling it X and Y for the axes on the 2D image, we call them U and V because naming conventions. Um, but that's literally all that UV means. You don't have to, it's not some complicated technical term. It's just X and Y with a different name for images. Um, and so when we're unwrapping something, thinking of like a bearskin rug, you're basically thinking of how do I 
slit it and then unfold it in such a way that it will flatten out nicely to avoid pinching and stretching as much as I can. Obviously, it's impossible to completely avoid pinching and stretching because we're dealing with something that is three-dimensional and has curvature and then trying to flatten it out. So um, pinching is unavoidable, but we can mitigate it as much as possible. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is we have all these pink lines here, which we used in the last class. These are showing us our mean creases when we were tightening up our high poly. We want to hide those so it doesn't distract us from seeing where we're cutting our seams. So in this menu, you can see there's a couple um, buttons at the bottom right of the Blender viewport. The ones at the far end are obviously our render view modes. Then there's like two boxes and then like two overlapping spheres which if you highlight says show overlay, the little drop down arrow next to us gives us a bunch of things that we can turn on and off and hide in our view. So we can turn off like the, the 3D grid, we could turn off the cursor, we could turn on wireframes and all kinds of extra things. What we want to do here is just turn off the one that says creases. And if we click that, suddenly all of our purple lines appear or disappear. So the creases are still being applied, but they're not distracting us in our 3D view. And so we're just going to focus on chopping up our object. So the first thing I'm going to do is, if you hold Alt, Left, uh, yeah, Left, Alt, and select, like we showed last week, we can select a whole ring of vertices. The bottom of our fire hydrant here, obviously we said this is going to be like the, uh, the um, pipe sticking up out of the ground. And so this is going to be a separate part that's going to be rusty, so we can actually cut this off. So Control and E gives us our edge menu. So Control F would also bring our faces. Control V would give our vertices. And these are all the options we can do to vertices, edges, or faces on a 3D model. So we're going to go Control E for edges and tell that all of these edges we just selected, we want to mark a seam. And a seam is basically where we'd be taking a knife and cutting off this part of the model um, to UV unwrap it. So we're cutting off the bottom because this little bottom bit is going to be a separate pipe. And while we're at it, I'm going to split our 3D view and turn this one into a UV editor so we can actually see what we're working on. So if I were to um, unwrap the model right now, so U for UV unwrapping, I like how all the, the letters are pretty much what you think in your head, and hit unwrap. Most of the model gets turned into like this crushed thing, but you can see that this bit at the bottom is now this ring at the bottom here. We can tell that it is, because if we go to the top right, there's like these two arrows that says link selection. And so if we select this, we can see that these edges on this part of the UV island link up to those edges on the pole or the uh, fire, um, pipe at the bottom. And if we cleared the seam so we didn't use a knife there and then unwrapped everything, you could see that it gets merged into this giant mess that is the entire fire hydrant, which is not so helpful. Um, because obviously, if the entire fire hydrant is turned into this one giant circular mess, the stuff at the top gets really, really, really crushed into a tiny, infinitesimally small point, which means that it's like really distorted and the stuff at the bottom gets really, really stretched out. Um, and if we were to try to apply a texture here, you'd obviously tell that you'd have a million pixels for the tiny ring at the bottom, and like 10 pixels for the very top of the fire hydrant, which is not useful. So this is where we're kind of deciding how to, how to skin the bear. Um, so we're going to go ahead and split off the bottom again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one edge at the back of the pipe and mark a seam for that. So basically, we're splitting off the pipe and we're cutting it down the middle because you can imagine we're going to unfold it like that. And if we've got a circle that we then split, it will unfold into like a flat strip of paper. So we can test this. Um, to select linked geometry, which is geometry that is connected to each other, let me select like one edge on the pipe and hit Control L for select linked. 
and tell it to limit by seams. So this will select everything that's linked within the same UV seam, so we can just select the pipe because we chopped it off from the rest of the uh, fire hydrant. And if we just unwrap the pipe, you can see it worked exactly like we intended. So we split off the pipe, and because we split it down the middle, we can unfold it into a nice flat strip, square, well, rectangular strip of, like, paper. And then if we were to texture this, it would be nice and flat and not distorted, which is perfect and exactly what we want. For the rest of the body of the fire hydrant, things become a little bit more interesting. Um, one of the kind of artistic technique things with UV unwrapping is because you are going to be, you know, chopping up the model, obviously there are going to be places where two bits of the, the uh, texture meet. So obviously, in this case, at the bottom here, the texture at the top is going to be bumping up against the texture at the bottom, so you might see the knife cut here if these two didn't match up perfectly on the texture. There are ways to like Photoshop it and make sure that both sides um, match each other and kind of hide the seam, but there's always going to be a knife cut that you're going to have to either patch up in Photoshop or you know understand that there's going to be a noticeable discontinuity of the texture across that cut. Um, and so one of the, the artistic things about UV unwrapping is figuring out where to put your seams so they are the least obtrusive and least noticeable as possible. So on something like a fire hydrant here, I might cut it along the back side for a racing game because from the road you'd always see the front of the fire hydrant, you'd never really see the back of the fire hydrant, so nobody would notice if there's a discontinuity seam along the back side. You'd never see that the texture is split there because you, you're just never going to see it. Um, so in this case, I will select from the just under the hat and then using control click. Control is select shortest path, um, as we talked about last week, so we'll select everything between the two points and make paths. So I'll select from the top down to the bottom uh, in a straight line and split the back of the fire hydrant just straight down the middle because that's where I feel would be the most hidden for most situations. You wouldn't be staring at the back of the fire hydrant. That's where I want to hide my seam. And while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and cut the top of the fire hydrant off, because then we can separate off the top of the fire hydrant as its own little bit. And because it's underneath the top of, like, I call the top of the fire hydrant a hat. It looks like a hat. I don't know why. If it's underneath the hat, you know, if you're a human being standing at, at normal heights, unless you're like crouching down and trying to tuck your head underneath it, you'd never see underneath the hat, so that seam will be perfectly hidden under there. So, if we were then to select the middle of the fire hydrant that we just did, and unwrap that, we can see it looks pretty good. Um, it's actually unwrapped fairly well, um, but you can see that the pipes, the little um, outlets that are sticking out, are turned into these little concentric rings, and again we're going to get um, pinching as these concentric rings get really, really small and all of this detail gets flattened. Because you can imagine, um, as an example, if I select all the faces on the front of this pipe and start to... to uh, grab them and push them in, basically we'd be flattening them like this, like an accordion. And so all those details are going to get crushed and flattened. So basically what I think we're going to do, what we're going to want to do, is separate off the outlets so that we can uh, address them separately and make them less distorted, because flattening them like an accordion like that would distort a lot of the details. You'd get a lot of stretching. So, we'll go ahead, I'll hide my seams kind of inside the first notches on each of these, so I'll hide a seam in there to cut off the side outlet here. I'll do the same thing on the other side, cut off this side of the outlet, and then hide the seam in here to cut off the front outlet and separate these out. And so now, let's unwrap again, see how things changed. We still have our main fire hydrant, which looks pretty good so far. And now each of these is a separate outlet. So these ones should be like the little bells on the side. So let's see, this one should be the one 
this is the little bell on the left side, this is the little bell on the right side, and then this should probably be the one on the front, and I assume this is the hat on the top. And now you can see we're starting to split these up. Each of these like sections in a UV grid is called an island, and so the island here is our pipe at the bottom, the island here is our main uh, body of the fire hydrant in the middle, and then each of these islands are the little outlets. Um, what I'm going to go ahead and do, just as an, as an extra step here, to help us visualize kind of how much stretching and pinching there is on the model, what we can do is actually apply a temporary texture, just so we can get an idea. So on this low poly fire hydrant, I'm going to go down to materials, create a new material, and I'll call it just fire hydrant. In our UV editor, I can create a new image, and I'll call this UV test, and change it under the type to a UV grid, and hit OK. And now you can see it generates us like this little randomized grid of squares and colored uh, tiles. And if we tell our base color to use an image texture and pick our UV test grid, then it will apply that to our model. Obviously we can't see anything in the viewport right now because we're using kind of a flat generic clay shader just to in our viewport. So under our render properties, our viewport shading properties, I can tell it, instead of using a random material, let's go ahead and use the texture. And I'll change it back to white so it's not tinting it. And now we can kind of see how our unwrapping is going. So as far as stretching and pinching goes, obviously there's a, because the, uh, the outlet is rounded at the front, there's a little bit of, of bulging here um, that's distorting the grid. Um, we can work on that momentarily. At the front, there's a little bit of stretching there, um, and we can kind of tell why, because there's a little bit of rounded pinching and stretching here. Our pipe at the bottom here looks pretty much perfect, because we managed to turn that into like a pretty much perfectly flat, you know, parallel edges, rectangular strip, which is exactly what we want. And then we still have a little bit of work to do on the bells, because you can see these are really distorted. You can see like this is meant to be a little red triangle like up here, or a little red cross. And that little red cross has been smeared across this bell because we've, even though we've separated it out, it's still being, you know, crushed in like an accordion, flattened like that, and that's crushing the detail. And so what we're going to do is similar to how we split the back of the fire hydrant to unfold it flat, we're going to cut down the bottom of the, the bell to unfold it flat this way. So I'm going to select from the middle of a bolt, hold control, select down to the bottom here, and then cut a seam down there. So I'm like taking a knife, and then I'll be able to unfold like that. Kind of difficult to like visualize in your head sometimes how this is going to unfold. But if we unwrap it, you'll see, whoa, if we unwrap it, you'll see it's taken the circular bell, we've split it, and now it's kind of flattened it out a little bit more. It's still somewhat curved, and there's not much you can do avo to avoid curvature in such a, you know, dynamically curved surface. But you can see that as far as stretching and distortion goes, that significantly improved the issues we were having, and I think that's going to be good enough. So we'll copy that same process. We'll go ahead, select an edge, cut down the middle, and unwrap that one. And so now this one is unwrapped in the exact same way. We've minimized the amount of distortions that we have, which is perfect. And then same thing to the one on the front. Let's cut it down the bottom, mark a seam, select it, and unwrap it. And so now all of these 
look fairly good with minimal distortions. We could do a lot more to, to play around with adding extra cuts and, and minimizing the distortion, um, but just for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to leave it at this is good enough on terms of distortion. Um, on the main body of the fire hydrant, I might add another seam in here and separate off like the brim at the bottom to try to reduce the amount of stretching and distortion that the brim might be adding to the body. So let's see how that changes things. Um, and it looks like we've significantly reduced the amount of stretching because the main body here is now a lot more square. And the brim obviously is curved, but there's it's hard to really change much curvature on something that is so... Um, so rounded. On on the main body of the fire hydrant, it's easy enough to flatten it out because it's not um, as wide, whereas on kind of the brim here, it extends, it juts way out, so it's got a very wide um, radius on it. So let's go and repeat the kind of same process we were doing. We're going to cut the hat straight up the middle like we did on the other one, so let's take the hat cut a line all the way up, just kind of following the surface up. Actually, we might want to start from the top here, because you can see this would reach uh, a face instead of cutting all the way to the middle. I want to cut from the middle, so let's cut like down this way. Cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down. And it doesn't matter if these seams meet up or not, because these are going to be totally separate islands in the UV unwrap. We'll add another seam under the top here to make the top its own separate piece. Just helps separate the geometry out. And let's go ahead and unwrap everything one last time and take a look. So there's a little bit of stretching and distortion at the top, but it's decently manageable. The bolt looks pretty good. The main body looks really quite good. Um, and one of the other things that we're kind of keeping in mind here is we don't want the grid applied to our object to look different, um, like different densities. So as far as like the, if I were to select just the top and scale it way up, you could see that the grid here is a lot uh, more dense than the grid here. Um, and you can see that it's a lot larger in the UV map than the other islands. We don't want that um, in most circumstances, because that means that the texture resolution would be a lot sharper here and a lot blurrier here, because a lot more pixels in the texture are being applied to the top than they are to the sides. We want everything to be kind of even, so that it's kind of evenly um, sharp in terms of, of texture density. So we'll go ahead, select everything, and if we unwrap everything together, it keeps everything um, proportional to one another. So there's no issues of one section of the geometry being a higher resolution than another section. Um, in some cases, you might want that. So if you're doing like a, um, a 3D character model, you might want to purposefully make the face higher resolution than like the hands, because you're more likely to look a character face to face than you are to look at their hands. So you might want to add as much of your texture resolution to, or focus more of your texture resolution on that part of their body instead of another part that you're not going to be looking at. Um, there are tricks to like getting the most out of a single texture to make sure that, you know, every pixel counts because every pixel, every texture is going to be adding more and more memory that has to be stored on the graphics card and in the RAM. Um, but we're not going to worry about that right now because that's really high level thinking for high level um, tasks. We're just focusing on the basics at the moment. So this is our model now completely unwrapped, good enough for what we need. So everything is fairly even. We've minimized the distortion a decent amount. Um, there is a little bit of wasted space, so if we look at our UV grid, you can see that up at the top here, there's basically pixels that are never going to be used. Um, and so there's some work that we could do to maybe reduce the amount of wasted space. So if I like rotated this and moved it up here, maybe I could like shift things around and scale them up and get more space out of here. So if I go to UV and pack, 
it might try to pack these. In fact, doing what I just did, it actually packed them smaller, so I'm actually wasting more space. So let me undo that. Um, there is kind of an art to packing things as densely as possible and making sure that you're not wasting any pixels, um, you know, using as much as you can out of every single um, texture that you can. But for this case, because we're doing a single model, a single object, we're not really worried about optimization too much. We're going to call this good enough. So this is everything we need to do for the UV unwrapping. This is good enough. So I'm going to hit save, save my file. And now what we want to do, now that we have everything unwrapped, we have our objects, our high and low poly, we are now ready to export it, bake down our t details, and then head on over to actually texturing it. So I'm going to go to File, Export, and I'm going to export an FBX file. FBX is um, the file format used by um, Maya and Autodesk, um, but it's kind of, because Maya is industry standard, it's kind of the most, it and like OBJ files are some of the most um, universal and widely accepted file formats for 3D softwares. So um, I could save an uh, uh, OBJ out, but an FBX has a little bit more extra information in there, so I'm going to go ahead and use that. And so I made folders earlier for baking and texturing. So in my baking folder, I'm just going to save out an FBX file and just export both our high and low poly in one file. And it will take a few seconds. I'm going to get that little Windows spinny thing, and now it's exported. Perfect. So now we are ready to jump over to Marmoset Toolbag. So Marmoset Toolbag is uh, a really useful tool for doing this next step. Um, what it's generally used for, and I can go ahead and open uh, a recent scene to give you a demonstration, it's used for creating um, previews of like finished scenes. So you could export this to the web and people could actually like zoom around and see your 3D models. Um, and you can set up like animations and stuff. It's a good like um, previewing tool. It's kind of like a, a video game render engine, but separated out into its own little, you know, artistic scene layout tool. But the other thing that it is really powerful for is that it has really powerful baking tools for doing this high poly to low poly um, process. So what I'm going to do, I don't want to save changes, I'm going to create a new scene. Um, in the sky, I'm going to change this. Presets. I like the preset of indoor fluorescence because it's nice even lighting. Um, so when we import our model, it'll have nice even lighting. And then up at the top here, we have this little thing that looks like a loaf of bread. I'm going to click on the loaf of bread and it's going to add a new baking tool to the scene. And the baker is what we're going to use to transfer our details. And so you can see when we've added this little loaf of bread, this baker, you can see it has a group here. It has high polygon and low polygon. And because we used the naming conventions earlier of high and low, when we open up our FBX file in our quick loader, it's actually going to automatically separate out our high and low polygons into their own folders for us, which is really convenient. So I'm going to go to load. I'm going to locate the FBX file that I just exported. Uh, da, 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 could not locate file for, would you like to browse for it? No, that's fine. And we can see that it's opened up, and so it's now renamed the folder Fire Hydrant, and inside of Fire Hydrant it has the high polygon and the low polygon separated out automatically, which is exactly what we wanted. So we'll go back to click on the piece of bread, because the bread is um, the baker, and the baker has all of the tools that we're going to be using. So at the top of the baking section, we have H, L, and P. So H and L turns on and off the visibility of the high polygon objects and the low polygon objects. So if I click L, it will hide the low poly, and you can see we're just seeing our high poly, our really high resolution model. If I click H, it hides the high poly, and then L will show the low poly again. So this is our low polygon model, and this is what I want to be focusing on so you can actually see when we bake down the details, the change that happens to the surface. So in our options here, our output, I'm going to change the name of the output using the little buttons. I want to send this to my baking folder, and I'm going to call this FH for fire hydrant and call it baked for our baked maps. And it's automatically going to create um, 
a separate uh, file for each of the textures that we bake out. So we're going to bake out a few different things. We're going to do a normal, a curvature, an ambient occlusion, um, and a position map. And I'll explain what those mean as we go along, um, but it's going to name each of these because I named this FH bake, it's going to call it FH bake underscore normal underscore ambient occlusion underscore curvature, etc., for as many texture maps that we wanted. And so under configure, you can see there's a bunch of different maps that we could actually bake out of here. And each of these have different uses and different, um, and give you different information that you could use for your texturing. Um, so we can kind of do a rundown of the most common ones, and I'll go over what each of them do and why you'd want them. So normals, as we ex I explained on the whiteboard earlier, what we're doing is we're taking a texture and faking a smooth surface in between all of the flat edges and the flat faces on our model. So we're going to take the details and fake extra curvature on the surface, and that's what the normal map does. It fakes those normals to fake... Um, transitions in the geometry between edges that we otherwise wouldn't have on our really low polygon model. Um, a curvature map shows us how sharp the uh, contours on the surface are. So we can see like at the top of the um, the hat here, we would have a really sharp corner right here on this edge because there's a really rapid transition from flat underside to flat edge with a really sharp corner. And so this would highlight our sharp edges. And the reason that a curvature map is really useful is because if we know where our sharp edges on the model are, we can then do really interesting things like focus um, scratches and scuffs and, and nicks on the surface on our hard edges. Because if you think of where are the most likely bits of, of anything in the real world to get scratched and scuffed, it's going to be on the sharp pokey out bits that are most likely to rub up against and bang onto things. Um, so if you pick up any object that you use on a daily basis, like your phone or a knife or anything like that, you'll notice that the really worn edges are the really raised, sharp corners on things. Um, thickness is one that you also use, especially for um, creatures. Um, basically, it, it tells how... Um, how thick the surface is. So a really thin surface would be like um, your ears are a really thin part of your body, whereas like your cheeks, obviously you've got the entire width of your skull underneath you. It's a really thick, meaty bit of your body. And so using a thickness map, it will show where the thin parts are, where the thick parts are, and then you can do interesting things like um, subsurface scattering, which is the effect of like if you shine a flashlight through your fingers and everything glows red, the thin parts glow red because um, it, the light's going through your skin, but if you were to try to do that to like your stomach, obviously you wouldn't see glowing on the back side of your rib cage because the light has so much further to transfer through that it just gets absorbed by your body. So the thickness map is really useful for showing you know where the thin bits are and where light would actually pass through skin or um, like wax on a candle or something along those lines. So we want normals, we want curvature because we want to take our details from the high resolution, we want to get our sharp edges where all of these scuffs and nicks are going to happen. And then the last one we're going to do is called ambient occlusion. And what ambient occlusion is, is it's all of the really hidden crevices and corners where shadows and light kind of finds it really difficult to reach. And what it's really useful for is not only showing us, um, not only giving us like extra faked shadows in really tight corners, which is useful um, to reduce the amount of work that the GPU has to do, you know, faking lighting, but it also um, little crevices and cavities are the places where dirt and grime tends to build up. So if you think of um, rocks or bricks on the front of your uh, house or something along those lines, um, you know, dirt builds up on it, rain will wash down it, and the rain will tend to pool and puddle in little cracks and crevices and carry the dirt and debris into those recessed corners and trap it there. And so having a map that shows us where um, our cracks and crevices are, that where things get trapped, we can then like focus dirt and grunge and, and debris into those places where like we'd naturally expect it to end up. So those are the three that we want to turn on right now. We want to have normals, we want to have curvature, and we want to have ambient occlusion to get our sharp edges where nicks and scuffs are going to happen.
the recessed crevices where all of our dirt and debris is going to end up, and then to bake down the normals, get the high resolution details from our high polygon. So with those three set up, we are ready to bake. And so it's literally as simple as hitting this bake uh, button up in the top left. Click bake. It will take a little while depending on how powerful your computer is because it's it's like shooting, it's projecting the details from one to the other. And immediately it looks like nothing happened. And that's because, as I mentioned, HLP, it's turning off on and off high, low, and this turns on and off whether or not we see a preview of what we did. So let's turn on the preview, and boom! You can see that we just got a bunch of details from our high polygon, but we're still on our low polygon geometry. You can still, if you get really close, you can see this like stair-stepping effect of our low polygon geometry. But if we zoom out, as far as like our lighting is concerned, we suddenly get all of the extra details that we didn't have before. So we get the little indentations from our high polygon that are literally not there. If I click on this, you can see like the green flash of the uh, the wireframe. Those those indents literally do not exist as physical geometry, but they transfer down from the other model. Um, if I turn on and off the preview, you can see that. Why am I not turning on and off the preview? Preview. Why you not do what I tell you to do? Why you confuse me? Well, it doesn't want to turn off the preview. Anyway, you can see that everything has been sharpened up, and we get all of the like extra details that we didn't have before transferred from our other model onto this model. And if we go into our files, we can see that we get separate files for each of the maps that we want. Now, these are saved out as Photoshop files. We could have, in our outputs, told it to be um, a PNG or a JPEG or anything else. Um, but we're going to take these into the next tool called Substance Painter to do our actual like creative art texturing. And Substance Painter will actually use Photoshop files and if you were to be editing the Photoshop file, like you opened it up in Photoshop, made some tweaks, and then saved it out again, you could then refresh it in Substance Painter and update that dynamically, which is why I prefer to save out PSDs compared to like um, saving out uh, just a JPEG, where you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, whereas if it's a Photoshop file, it's a Photoshop document, and you can edit that and save it, and it updates like like a Photoshop document. So now we are pretty much ready to jump over into Substance Painter, and we're going to use all of the maps that we just saved out to take our low polygon and make it look really nice and shiny like a finished video game model. So I can close Marmoset because we're done there. And the last thing I want to do is the FBX that we saved out included both models, but we only want to be working on our low polygon in Substance Painter. So I'm literally going to hide our high polygon select our low polygon, and I'm going to save out one more FBX file. Make sure that selected objects is enabled, so it's only going to save out our low polygon that we have selected. And I'm going to name this something like fire hydrant underscore low, so I know that this is the low polygon on its own. Give it a few seconds. Make sure that I've saved out that file. I have. And so now we can go ahead and open up Substance Painter and do like the actual creative art side of this project. Now, the reason I'm using uh, da -da -da -da, TDR, yeah, it might pop up this thing. You can hit continue anyway. That little warning is just saying that if you were to do something really heavy in Substance Painter, um, your GPU might hang for a few seconds and might um, the driver might time out to event like a, a blue screen of death, um, and so it's suggesting a technique you can where you can go into like the Windows registry and change how long it takes before the the GPU times out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of advanced Windows user stuff. Recommending that people change their registry is um, not something for the uninitiated in terms of like knowing how to use Windows. So we're not going to bother with that because it's going to be fine. We're not going to do anything too heavy today. Um, so, where was I in my train of thought? Because I've completely lost myself.
Uh, yeah, so we saved out the model. We're going to go into Substance Painter. Oh yes, what I was mentioning. The reason that we're using Marmoset Toolbag and we're using Substance Painter to do our texturing and baking, there are free alternatives. So you can do normal map baking um, or texture map baking in Blender. You can do um, some texture painting in Blender. And there are some free tools out there that will let you do texture painting. Or you could use Photoshop to do it you know, by hand. Or you could, um, like Quixel uh, was picked up by Epic Games very recently, and so Quixel Mixer is now a tool that you can use for, for doing texturing on 3D models. Um, and it's free because Epic Games made all of their stuff free, which is awesome. But um, Mixer is was initially designed as a way to tweak and edit photo scanned um, textures, not to actually work on 3D models, and so the tools there are kind of clunky and unintuitive and not recommended. Um, baking textures out of Blender is a little bit clunky, not perfect, a little bit, um, there's like, there's no anti-aliasing on the baking or anything like that, so it's not perfect. You can't bake out as many different maps as you can with a marmoset. Unfortunately, as of April 2020, there still aren't that many really good free alternatives to substance or marmoset paint uh, tool bag which are currently the industry standard tools for both hollywood vfx industry and for the video game industry um, for doing texturing on 3d models um, before we jump into texturing on 3d models um, and what makes like substance and all the modern stuff really nice and useful i'm going to step it back a bit and explain what PBR rendering and PBR texturing is, and so what we're going to be doing in our texturing software. So if I jump over to the documents we had for this class, I threw a couple bits of reading material in the Google Drive, which I will also link in the archive on YouTube. Um, you don't have to look at these right now. So the texturing process we're going to be doing right now is using a workflow called PBR texturing. PBR literally stands for physically based rendering, which means that it's a rendering technique that's based on like how light actually physically interacts with things in the real world. Um, in 2012, Pixar, um, Disney Pixar, put out a really uh, unique and interesting um, research paper describing what they called a principled approach to physical rendering in um, in the computer. And their idea was to take all of the physical properties of light in reality and turn them into a set of artistic principles that are really easy for artists to create surfaces that mimic reality without being like super scientific and heav heady and hard to actually follow for somebody who isn't, you know, a um, a photon physicist or anything along those lines who doesn't know the, the math and the physics behind it. You can just work on the artistic side of things and get realistic results on the other side. Um, and so the other two PDFs that I've included here are from um, Substance Painter, or Substance, um, the company that designed Substance called Algorithmic. They have a um, a section of their website, their support website, where they actually have um, learning materials for learning how to work with substance and the PBR process in general. And so this is really good, like general reading for what the artistic side of, of PBR is. So there's two PDFs. The first one goes into all of like the math and physics side of like, what does all of this actually mean and how does light work in the real world? The second document actually deals with the artistic side of like, how do we actually use this approach, this workflow um, in an artistic um, process. And so there are four properties that we have to um, worry about for the most common PBR workflow, which is the metal roughness workflow. You have your base color, which is all of the surface colors that are underneath the surface. We have a roughness property. And roughness basically is how smooth or how um, rough the surface is. So you can think of like a mirror is perfectly smooth and will give you perfect sharp reflections. Whereas if you took um, some low grit sandpaper to that mirror and roughed up the surface, it'd be a really, um, it wouldn't be a perfectly smooth mirror anymore and the reflections would be really blurry. And so the roughness allows us to change how shiny or how not shiny a material is. Um, Metalness is basically what it sounds like. Metals reflect light slightly different from non-metals. Um, 
So having a slider that lets us pick, is this a metal, is this plastic, lets you change the reflections like that. And then the last texture we have is our normal map, which we can use to, um, like, like we did in the last step, we baked down details from a high polygon object to a low polygon object. What we can also do is manually paint details into the normal map, and then like artistically add extra things, like we could add bolts or scratches or scuffs that we didn't physically sculpt or physically model, but then just paint them on and add extra detail to our surface. And so those are like the four um, main properties that we worry about in a PBR metal roughness workflow. Um, so when we go back into Substance Painter, you can see that at the bottom we have our tool shelf, and we have these actual individual things, um, these tools, these substances. And so a substance in Substance Painter, unlike in, say, Photoshop, where you're just painting with colors, in Substance Painter, you're actually painting with materials that have all of those physical properties combined into that material. So you have your sh how shiny the surface is, you have all of the little micro scuffs and details, you have um, what color it is, all of those wrapped up into one easy to use thing. So you can literally just drag and drop, I want this to look like blue plastic, and just apply blue plastic to all of your model, and it simplifies from an artistic standpoint applying textures to an object and having all of like the physical properties combined into one simple, easy to work with workflow. So we're going to create a new project. We're going to select in our files, we're going to find where our low poly FBX is. So let's go ahead, mine are under Famalab classes. This is class number three, and we saved out our low poly as its own separate object. I'm going to set the initial document resolution to 2K, and under our normal map format, Blender uses OpenGL. A lot of other softwares like um, uh, like Unreal Engine might use DirectX, but because we're going to be sending this back to Blender, we're going to use OpenGL, and we're just going to hit OK. And now you can see it's imported our model. Up in our texture sets, we've created a fire hydrant texture set. And the reason it's called fire hydrant is because we gave it a material in Blender called fire hydrant. Um, if we had multiple materials applied to this model, or we had multiple models with different materials, there would be more texture sets open in Substance Painter, and we could paint on each of those separately. But in this case, we just have the one, and it simplifies everything for us. So, on the left, we have our 3D model. On the right, we have our 2D UV unwrapped texture set. If I hold Alt and middle click, we can move around in both the 3D view and the 2D view. Alt and uh, left click lets me orbit around, rotate the view, and right click lets me zoom in and out. So I can move, I can rotate, I can zoom in and out, which is really nice and useful. So the first thing we want to do is we want to take all of the texture sets that we baked in Marmoset, bring them into, su into Substance Painter, and apply them so we get all of the details that we just saved from the last step and bring them into Substance. So we're going to go ahead, find our Photoshop files, and I'm just going to drag them down into the taskbar and drag them into Substance Painter. And it's going to pop up a little window saying Import Resources, and it's going to ask us a few things. First thing is, do we want to add like an optional prefix or like a category for them? So we could call these like bakes, just so we know that these are our baked textures. The next thing we want to do is under undefined, we it wants to know is this a texture, is this an environment, is this an alpha? Alphas are used for like paintbrushes, so it's like a stencil, it's a stamp that we could use. Um, LUTs are used for like tinting the the lighting and the coloring. It's like um, color grading in in um, in, in movies, when you're doing color grading in your video editing, the LUTs are useful because you can actually, if you were to use, um, if you were to be using Substance Painter in a VFX workflow for a movie, you could actually apply to your camera the same color grading that you'd see in the final movie to make sure that all the lighting and stuff looks proper, but we're not going to be using that here. Um, environment is our HDR maps, where so we can get lighting from real world environments. Obviously, this isn't that. What we're importing are textures which we're going to then apply to the model. And then at the bottom of this window, it wants to ask us, are we only using this 
um, while substance is open in the current session. So if we close the window and open the window again, it would forget that we imported these. Are we importing these to the project? So when we save the file and open the file on this computer or another computer, are they going to you know, save with the project? Or are we importing these to the shelf? So these are going to become tools that are permanent um, across all projects. Um, if I were to be importing alphas for my paintbrushes, I might want to put it in the shelf and then use those paintbrushes on all of my projects. But because these maps are baked specifically for the fire hydrant, we only want this in the current project. And so I'll just import it for just the current project. And before I forget, I will save the current project. So if there's a crash or anything happens, we don't lose anything. You learn very quickly in anything that you're doing, save often or you will have regrets. <laughs> so we have the textures, they are imported now, and now they are in the texture section of our shelf. You can create new folders for, and create your own categories, um, but it comes with a few categories by default. So we have our alphas, we have our textures, we have brushes and materials. So in our textures, these three are the texture sets that we just imported, and now we want to apply them to the model so we can actually see the details that we had before. So under our texture set settings, let's expand this window out a little bit. This tells us all the properties for this current texture set. So we're currently going to be painting base color, height, roughness, metal, and normal. Um, we could add extra channels if we wanted to paint extra details on this map. So if we wanted to paint ambient occlusion or displacements or opacity or anything like that, you could add extra um, texture sets that you're working with, but these are perfectly fine by default. What we want to do is under mesh maps here, these are like the global um, textures that are applied all the time, which is going to include the maps that we saved out of Marmoset, which gives us all of our details. So we want to drag in our normal map and drop it on top of normal map, and you can see that in the viewport pop, everything got smoothed out. So if I remove it, you can see low poly, we lose all the details, drag it back in onto normal map, and everything pops, and we get all the details that we baked in the last step. Now I'm going to repeat that, curvature, drag it onto curvature, and ambient occlusion, we're going to drag that onto ambient occlusion. And so now all of the detail maps that we had in the last step, we can apply in this step. And so one of the really powerful things about Substance Painter is because we have these maps, we can actually do procedural effects to add scratches or dirt or things into uh, onto our surface using those maps that we applied to the whole mesh as the kind of the guiding um, information for it. So like I was explaining earlier, ambient occlusion can be used to focus dirt into the crevices. And we can do that in Substance Painter because Substance Painter has tools specifically that use ambient occlusion to mask off parts of the model to focus details onto those parts of the model. So the first thing that we want to do is obviously open up our references that we had from last class. So we actually have photo reference of what we're working on. So this will be in the Google Drive folder. Um, there's a JPEG or a PureRef file if you're actually using PureRef for your references. I like PureRef, so I'm going to go ahead and keep using PureRef. And I'm going to drag this over. So the first thing we want to do is apply the paint to our fire hydrant. And we're going to use kind of the yellow paint here and the red paint here to give us an idea of how paint on a fire hydrant tends to look, which is really, really gloopy. Like really runny, really blobby, like they just slapped it on and let it dry and walked away while it dripped and, and blobbed everywhere. So, going back to our layers, in Substance Painter, you have um, like your paint brushes and properties down here and your layers here. Your layers you can think of exactly like Photoshop layers. So I can create new layers and paint on them and they'll stack and you can use blending modes just like in Photoshop. For all intents and purposes, Substance Painter is like Photoshop but for 3D models. Um, the only difference is, as I was mentioning, when you go down to materials, 
you're not just applying a single color with each layer, you're applying an entire material. So if I were to drag in this um, like interesting aluminum material in here, you can see it doesn't just apply a color, it applies the shininess, the metalness of it, all of the bumps and details. So let me go ahead, let's see if there's something more interesting, like this plastic with a grid. You can see the plastic, suddenly there's a diamond pattern, the light is reflecting off of it, you can see like the bumps of the diamond pattern in the plastic, how um, shiny or like not shiny the plastic is, are applied in a single layer altogether. To work with the individual channels, as I mentioned, we've got color, normals, roughness, and metalness. You can actually switch up top here. So you got base color, roughness, metalness, and normals. And when we're working with normals, generally we're actually going to work with a height map because it's a little bit easier to work with. So a height map is black and white, so you'd be painting like with a white brush, the white areas are raised, the black areas are lowered. A normal map is kind of a weird RGB thing that tells the light which way to bounce around. For artistic purposes, we paint on the height map, and then when we export, it automatically turns the height map into a normal map, so we don't have to worry about things. So if I were to go to a paintbrush layer and paint just on the height, I can add extra height detail in here, and it automatically turns it into a normal map for me, which saves me a lot of headache and struggle. And then if I were to tell this to just show me my height details, you can see I'm painting height, and when I go back to material, it shows me like how the reflection changes to make it look as if the surface is now raised. And so, in our layers, because they're like Photoshop layers, our blending modes, this is the blending mode for base color. If we switch this to height, this is our blending mode for height. If we switch it to roughness, this is our blending mode for roughness. So you just kind of focus on each layer is an entire material, and then you can change like your blending modes and your opacities per channel, for per um, property on, on the material. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete everything I just did because that was just demonstration. The first thing we want to do is create a new fill layer. A fill layer applies to the entire model at once, whereas a paint uh, whereas a um, uh, a normal layer that isn't a fill layer um, only applies where you actually physically paint stuff. So I want fill because I want to apply the paint to the entire model, and I'm going to change this fill. Scroll down in the properties, so we have our properties base color, height, roughness, metallic. It's the base color because it's a fire hydrant, I want it to be red. And so now you can see the whole fire hydrant turns red. Let's go ahead, drag our reference photos back over. And let's use this like red fire hydrant as a reference. So that looks pretty close. Um, the paint on the fire hydrant looks like it's significantly shinier and more mirror-like than the reflections that we have over here. So we literally, we take our roughness, if we make it more rough, the reflections become less shiny. If we make it less rough, the reflections become way more mirror-like and shiny. So let's say maybe around 0 0.15, 0 0.15, we can type that in. That seems to kind of roughly match the photo reference we have here. Looks pretty good. And so I'm going to rename this fill layer. If I double click on the name, I'll just call this paint base because this is like the base color and the base, you know, information for all of the paint. And now the next thing we want to do is start adding some of the bubbles and wrinkles and warps that the paint has done where it's like dripped and blobbed and globbed everywhere. So I'm going to create a new fill layer and I'm going to name this one height. As far as like how I personally like to work, I like to like separate out my properties into separate layers. So I will go ahead and work on all of my height information for this material on its own separate layer. So in my properties, I'll turn off color, roughness, metalness, normals. This one will literally only be height information. And so in our height here, 
this will be where we're going to be applying all of the bubbles and stuff. To add our bubbles and stuff, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and add a fill modifier to this layer. And so what you can do is you could actually, um, there are modifiers you can apply to layers, just like in Photoshop you have, um, you could add Gaussian blurs or sharpens or things along those lines to layers to change how they look. In Substance Painter, you have the same sort of things. You can paint on them, you can add levels, so you could like, um, just like in, in Photoshop where you can do curves, you can adjust the contrast of a layer, you can add filters like blurs, like Gaussian blur and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to add another fill because I'm going to layer a bunch of different um, height details on top of this like one layer. So in this fill, again, I just want to work with height. I'm going to go to our procedurals which are a bunch of like randomized computer generated noises. And the first thing I'm going to add is a cloud. Where's clouds? Clouds three. If I drag this onto the height, you can see that now we have a bunch of really ugly noise added to the surface. The height is being affected by the clouds texture. And now we have some properties we can change about the clouds texture. So I can do stuff like I can turn the contrast up and down, the balance up and down. So I'll leave the balance where it was, which is like 0.5 in the middle. I could change the contrast if I wanted to. I could go up and change the scale if I wanted to. And so for this, the first step I want to do is add like the really wide um, bumps and bubbles, the subtle wide bumps and bubbles. So the first thing I can tell is Obviously, the opacity on this is way too high because the effect is way too strong. So let me turn this down. I'll turn the opacity down to like 15. That's 51. I can type me. I can spell. And then we'll just tweak the scale here until it looks about right. So around, let's see, maybe 1.2 looks about right for like the really, uh, maybe that's even too detailed. Maybe. 0.8. Just play with this until the scale looks about right. Maybe 3, because then it looks somewhat like the bumps and blobs on the surface of the paint in a reference. And we always want to use photo reference so we can get like idea of what it looks like in the real world, because trying to guess from memory never really works. You always end up with like a caricature, caricature of reality. So I'll go ahead, turn the opacity down even more, maybe down to like 5, and now we get like the subtle little bumps and ripples in the surface of our paint. And so we're going to go ahead again, add right click and add another fill and it's going to be on top of the last one um, and then this one we're going to add some of the bigger like big bubbles and blobs in the surface of the paint so the big drips and so let's go down and find maybe like let's hover over some of these grunge spots maybe not grunge shavings maybe yeah, let's try shavings. Let's go ahead. Again, I'm turning off everything but height. I just want this to be height information I'm adding. Drag this in, and let's see how this looks. Um, way too strong, but that's looking pretty good and pretty close to what I wanted. So again, I can go ahead and turn the opacity on this down. Let's say maybe like 10. 10 might even be too strong. Um, and it looks like these are a little bit too large still, like compared to our photo reference. So again, I can go to the scale, tweak the scale, maybe make these like a scale of three, and turn the opacity down some more. So it's like, yeah, opacity of three looks about right. And so now we get all these little blobs and stuff where it looks like the paint's either dripped or maybe like while the paint was drying some sand blew in and got underneath the paint so they didn't clean the, the fire hydrant before painting it, that kind of thing. Which looks pretty good, pretty cool. And we're going to repeat this one more time and we're going to add some like scratches. So on some of the paint you can see like these straight lines in the paint. Um, 
some places it's kind of hard to tell. Um, so like here, where you get like these straight lines where it's, I don't know, maybe a piece of grass like whipped past and then dented into the paint or something along those lines, or maybe it was like a brush stroke. Um, so we're going to add some like straight lines to this. So one more time, right click, fill. I'm going to turn off everything except height for this fill. And let's grab one of these like scratches and add the scratches, and then we get a bunch of like straight lines in the paint. Mess around with the scale, maybe a scale of like four, and then in the scratches we got a bunch of options for like quantity, so I can turn down the number of little lines down. Maybe 0.2 looks about right. And just like last time, the opacity is way too high, it's way too strong. Let's make this effect really subtle. Let's like maybe two. And now you get really subtle little lines and streaks in the paint, like randomly flecked around the surface. Which looks pretty good, pretty cool. So now we have a bunch of extra detail in our paint that we didn't have before. Um, if you hold shift and right click, you can actually rotate the world, rotate the lighting. So I'm kind of moving the lighting over to the front so I can see what the front looks like a little bit better. So yeah, this is looking pretty good. So now I get all the little bumps and bubbles in the paint, and we can see if we like use the eyeball, turn on and off the layer, we're getting the color and the shininess from the base layer, but we're getting all the height detail from the height layer. And that's why I like to separate off um, like the properties into their own layers in Substance Painter, so that I can quickly toggle on and off and see what each of these layers is doing. So this layer is the big little like bits of sand and bubbles, this layer is like the, the subtle ripples in the paint underneath, and then this one is like the scratches and the bits of twigs and stuff that got in the paint there. And so each one separates off and you can tell which is which. And so I can even rename these as like um, twigs height. I can rename this one as like sand bubbles height. And this one as like subtle ripples. And just so I always kind of keep track in my head, and then if I ever have to open this project up later, if it's like weeks down the line and I don't remember what's what, I can go through and I have a good organizational system to then go back and like update um, the material as needed. And again, I'm going to hit Control S, save my progress, make sure everything is saved. And so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add um, some of the stains to the surface. So if we go and zoom in here, you can kind of see that there are like little bits of like white stains on the surface, like water droplets, like mildew and mold has, has grown and started to build up in some of the places where like rain has landed and, and dried and, and left behind all of these like patterns of mold and mildew. So let's go ahead and add a layer for that. So I'm going to add a new fill layer. Um, and the reason I like using fill layers versus um, like hand painting on details is because all of these things are dynamic. So like I was um, toggling on and off, if I just turn back my height details, like I was toggling on and off the sand and the sand is, you know, applying itself to the entire surface. I didn't have to click like manually by hand placing each individual blob of paint and each individual blob of sand. Um, fill layers and using the generators and the masks means that everything is dynamic. I don't have to hand paint things. I don't have to, if I want to tweak and change stuff later, like if I wanted to go back and change the, the, the color of the paint, if I hand painted it, it would be really annoying to have to hand paint the entire model a different color. But here, if I want to make this into a yellow fire hydrant, I just change the color into a yellow fire hydrant. If I want to make it red again, if I want to make it a blue fire hydrant or whatever, it's really dynamic, and then I don't have to worry about hand painting details. It's always quick and easy to go back and update and change things. If I want to change how shiny or not shiny it is, I have a single slider that I can go back to every time, and it will be um, really quick and easy to make updates and changes. So my mildew, I'm going to apply white to the entire surface, mask off the areas where the mold, the mold and mildew is going to apply, and then apply the mold and mildew um, uh, pattern to those areas that I masked off. So first thing I'm going to call this, um, let's call them water stains. Um, 
I'm going to turn off height detail, turn off metalness, turn off normals. I do want roughness because the, the stains on the surface are going to be less shiny than the paint underneath. So let's make this like less shiny, like 0.6 roughness. Um, and this like off white gray color is perfect for like the stains that I want. And step one I'm going to do is right click and add a black mask. And so um, if you think of Photoshop where you've got your, your masks, black um, is transparent, everything is invisible, white is where it's actually showing up. And so if I look at my layer stack, I can select either my layer and change its properties or my mask and change it. So I can paint on the mask and it shows whatever my material is underneath. So if I were to change this to blue, you can see that what I'm painting, and if I'm painting in my mask, is I'm showing the blue. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to undo everything I just did. I'm going to use this black, black mask and add generators that then dynamically apply the mask for me. So this is where our curvature and our ambient occlusion maps that we saved out earlier become really powerful. So I'm going to go down, scroll down to my smart masks and all of these are generators that use the information in our in our texture sets that we that we saved out to then dynamically apply um, details to our surface so we've got some over here if we hover over these you can see that like um, there's some design for dirt that is in the cavities or for dry dirt that applies all over the surface or for like scratches on the edges of fabric or um, scratches on the edges of metal um, softer spots, things like that. So there's even one here called stains and scratches or spots. Uh, ooh, that one's new. Water drips. That's neat. So I'm actually going to try. Let's try spots and drag this mask over. And that's kind of the effect we were going for um, just in one step. Now, it's not exactly what I was going for because these spots are less um, detailed than I wanted. So I'm actually going to show a slightly more uh, dynamic way of doing this, but you can see how powerful it is where I could turn, I now have this uh, dirt generator where I could add more or add less, um, add disorder to like scatter it more or less. If I were to use some of these other more dynamic ones like um, the dust one, I could actually focus it in in different places, like would I want it to be more in the ambient occlusion or not in the ambient occlusion? Would I want it to be in the on the raised surfaces, on the not raised surfaces? The generators become super powerful. But in this case, what I want to do is I want to start with a... Where is it? Alphabetical order. Is it just under tools? Nope. Tools, smart masks. Let's start off with one like, ah, that's the one I wanted, Dust Occlusion. Let's drag and drop this in here, and you can see that now it's added, it's masked off like the low parts and some of the interiors, like the, the recesses and crevices in the curvature. The places where if like rain were to land and start dripping and pooling, this is where all the water would end up kind of dripping and puddling and pooling and bringing the dirt along with it and that's where it would evaporate off and that's where all the like the stains that we would expect to see would end up so i'm going to go ahead i want to like turn up the contrast maybe or maybe turn down the contrast a little bit so it's on more of the surface uh, i could turn the level up or down to add more or less of it maybe add it a little bit more And then the last thing I'm going to do to make this look more like the little rounded blobs of water staining that we see on the actual um, reference photo is I'm going to right click, add another fill layer, and just like our blending modes in Photoshop, I want to do the multiply blending mode because this will kind of remove in black areas. I'm going to go back to our procedurals, and there's a stain procedural in here, or a grunge drip in here somewhere, which looks exactly like the kind of stains that we want to apply to this surface. So let me go ahead and find alphabetical order, things are difficult, or is it under grunges? Maybe it's under grunges. There we go. Grunge spots. Spots, dusty, shavings, stains. Stains, that looks exactly like what we're looking for. 
hollow. So let's try the spots and drag this over. And now we have spots. And we could like change the scale of these spots, change them up and down. But because we are multiplying them over the, uh, so we added the generator and we're multiplying these over the top, you can see that the spots are not everywhere. The spots, if we turn the dirt level down, we can actually shrink and grow where the spots are appearing. The spots are actually sort of applying, um, are like cutting into the dirt that we added below it, so they're only showing up in the places that we masked off previously. And then if we wanted to go back and change in, like, I don't like these spots, maybe I want to use this uh, stain texture instead. I can use the stain texture instead. And then I'm adding stains to just those places that I masked off. And so I could scale this up a bunch. And then I've got water stains. And I could turn up the dirt level. We turn up the contrast. And then I've just got these dirt stains only in the places that I expected them to show up, only in the crevices, only in the low places where water would puddle and pool. Now these are a little bit big, so I'm actually going to go back. Let's change these out for some different stains. Um, those spots kind of look neat. Those look like little like rag swirls. Just kind of find something that looks uh, more along the lines of what we were hoping for. Scratches, dirty, fine, rough, shavings. Yeah, let's try the spots again. Let's try the spots again, tweak their scale, and then maybe under here we could tweak the balance, see how changing the balance and contrast on them works. And so there's a lot of artistic freedom you could have with this. Maybe spots dirty. Swapping them out, trying different things. Basically, we're just looking for ones that look more like these like little ring bubble shapes, which we may just end up using the stains, the hollow stains. Yeah, let's just use the hollow stains. And scale that up so it repeats a lot more. And then we have little water stains on the surface of our paint where we expect them. Turn down the contrast, turn up the contrast, and if we want to see, like hide the stains and just see where we're applying them, turn the contrast up, turn that down. You can even go down and there should be like grunge amount you could change. Is it being the grunge kind of adds an extra like texture splitting to it, but if we turn that off and just turn up the levels, you can see it's kind of more of a smooth pattern. So let's like, do a smooth pattern and then use the grunge as our or our water stains as the pattern. And then under base color, I can turn the opacity down so the white is subtle. And then we have subtle water stains on the surface of our fire hydrant. So the next thing we're going to do, building on the whole uh, idea of uh, using masks and dynamic generators, we're going to add the like scratched edges. So if we go to some of these, you can see that there's like chips in the paint on some of the raised corners. If we go down to some of these other fire hydrants, like chips on the edges of the, the bolts, again, chips and things and scratches. And we can see, like, like I said before, all these scratches tend to happen on the really sharp raised areas that are, uh, are where stuff is likely to brush up against and like chip into the paint. So we can get like chips on the corner of the, uh, the bolts where people are going to be, you know, taking a, a plier and like t torquing on them. So we'll go to materials. We'll find a rough or rusty material. Ah, rust, rust fine, rust coarse. Let's go ahead and drag some rust into the scene. Now the thing is it will apply across the entirety of the surface, but that's fine. Right click, mask. So now we have it masked off. So now it's completely hidden. 
And just like we did before, under our smart masks, we're going to find one that will then just focus the rust only on the edges of our object. So let's find something like, not cavities, ah, there we go, edge scratched, edge dusty, edge strong, strong scratched, uh, uber, stone, maybe edge strong. And now you can see that the rust is focused exclusively on the sharp edges of our model, which is exactly what we want. So we can go ahead and in here, and you can see it's using our curvature map, down at the bottom here, our curvature to figure out where the sharp edges are. That's why we made the curvature map. And so we can tweak this. We can say, do we want less of it? Do we want more of it? So maybe it's a little bit strong. Let's do less, but maybe add some contrast so it's a little bit sharper. Another thing we could do is in our material, under our uh, properties, there's this one called height position. Uh, in the middle means that everything is kind of uh, it, uh, at the same, starting from the same height position. But if I move the height position down, you can see it like pushes into the surface and makes it look like the paint is at a higher level than the rust. So the paint looks like it's higher, thicker, on top of the rust. So I could tweak this, make it look like the paint is has got some depth to it, like the, the chips are actually cutting into the paint, into the surface underneath. So we've got raised edges now. Now these edges are a little bit too smooth and sharp, so we can do just like we did with the water stains, where we used the mask and then added a grunge to like chip into it. We can add a fill layer and then add some chips to what we just did. So we'll set this to multiply. Let's find like a scratched chip grunge material. So maybe some scratches rough. And we can tweak the scale on that. So it's like a bunch of scratches chipping into the paint. Maybe we'll uh, invert it so the scratches are chipping out of the paint. Nah, that looks silly. Let's not invert it. Don't invert it. What we'll do instead is we'll change the balance. There we go. And so now the, the paint is like cracked and chipped and distorted in different ways. And we can change the scale on that effect. And part of like the, the whole process of making something re look realistic is like levels of detail breaking up the surface because nothing in reality is like perfect and smooth. So like with the paint, we didn't just add one even level of the random ripples. We added little bubbles and things that are randomly placed around the surface. With the scratches, we're breaking up the scratches so they're not perfect. They're, they're randomized and chipped, um, which just helps with the whole feeling of realism. Um, and the one thing we haven't changed so far in terms of the feeling of realism is the roughness. The reflectivity is still perfectly the same across the model. We can go over here to our lighting modes. We can see color, height, roughness. Besides the rust, the rust is obviously a different material, but the paint is still like perfectly the same everywhere except for where we have those little water stains. So let's go ahead and break up some of the shininess, break up the roughness. So let's go ahead, add a new fill layer. Let's maybe add it under the rust so it's just on our paint. Um, and we can even put all of the paint stuff in its own folder, call this paint. So we just know, just to keep it organized like Photoshop, all this stuff is our paint layer. The stuff above it is the rust, rusty metal that we're cracking into the surface. So we'll call this one um, roughness stains. Switch this to my roughness mode, make sure that this fill layer is only affecting our roughness and nothing else, and we can add a grunge to that. So let's add like um, grunge dirty and apply that to the surface and set its roughness to be like, uh, uh, not subtract, screen. And then if we go back to our roughness view, we can still see if we go to the base paint layer and change the underlying roughness, if the underlying roughness is still globally controlled by our base layer, but now we have this stain that's applying on top of it, 
and if we go back to our lighting mode, you can see that it really changes the reflections. So let's go back, let's see, let's change the contrast, make the stains a little less prevalent. Go back to our lighting mode, and now you can see that where we had really even shininess everywhere before, we can even disable the the height detail so we can just focus on the reflections. Where we had e really even reflections before, really perfect reflections, the stains break up those reflections and add a bunch of extra detail into the shininess of our surface and how the light reacts to the surface. And then we add back in those like paint blobs and it's just layering details, layering the reflections, layering the height, and all these things kind of combine to make it look a lot more realistic. And then the last thing I'm going to do is we've got chipped paint, so we've got chips on the edges, we've got bumps and, and, and blobs in our paint. Let's add some dirt across the entire surface. So we can go to like our materials. Um, is there anything in here that's like really dirty? Um, we could maybe use rust as dirt, but rust is kind of metallic. So let's actually just make like a custom dirt. So let's go ahead, add a new fill layer, call this dirt. Uh, I don't want to change the height. I do want to change the roughness, not the metalness, not the normals. We'll make it like a, a sooty blackish brown color. We'll make it really rough because dirt is not shiny. Add a black mask and find one of our nice soft dirt, like dirty dirt, dirt cavities. Let's try dirt cavities. Uh, make sure to add a fill so we can actually, or not add a fill, just drag it onto our mask. There we go. Dirty dirt, that's a little bit too sharp actually. In fact, I don't like that at all. Let's remove what it just added. Uh, maybe dirt occlusion looks a little bit softer, a little bit more normal. Let's try that. There we go, that looks softer and more normal, so we can like toggle on and off. Dirt, you can see it's like adding dirt. And you can see it's adding dirt using the ambient occlusion map, like we baked out in the last step. It's adding it into the little recesses and cracks and crevices. Um, not only where like naturally water would fall and uh, and like drag the dirt to bring it with it, but on other objects, you can think of like if you're trying to clean off, um, you're trying to clean things around the house. Um, some of these like really tight corners are the places where it'd be really hard. You'd have to like get a, a Q-tip or, or like the uh, pencil on the end or a rag on the end of a pencil and like really try to get into those corners. It'd be really hard to clean it. So that's the kind of places where dirt would be really hard to clean and people might get lazy and that's where dirt would end up even if somebody's trying to like actively wipe down and keep something clean. Those are the places, the little recessed crevices where dirt just builds up naturally because it's hard to reach. Um, so we can go ahead and tweak this. We could play with the levels, make there be more dirt or less dirt. Let's maybe add some more dirt just for local flavor. Um, change the contrast to maybe make the dirt a little tighter. Um, maybe go into our base color and just turn the opacity down a little bit so it's not quite so strong. But now we have dirt applied. We've got like the chips in the paint where the rust is coming through. The, the shininess is not perfectly even. And now we have what looks like a fairly, I would say, realistic looking hydrant. So the last step we can do with this now is we can go ahead and export the textures that we just um, finished making, send them back over to Blender, and then I can show you how to like plug in the textures and make your model in Blender look pretty much identical to what it looks like here in Substance Painter. And the reason that we can transfer so easily between like Substance Painter and send these texture sets to Unreal Engine or to Blender or to Marmoset Toolbag and share them between them is because all modern software is using, Dis is using the principles of Disney's PBR approach and all of the industries have kind of linked together to use the same workflows, the same texture sets. Obviously, different render engines have different features and look very slightly different, but the the general approach that everybody has like standardized on now means that you can transfer your your texture sets and your models between softwares and get results that are fairly similar. Um, not identical, but um, it keeps everything standardized. So. We will go to File, Export Textures, 
and it will pop up this dialog. I can go ahead and like drag my references off screen now because I don't need them anymore. And so here we've got PBR Metal Rough. We can pick um, we can pick the texture sets that we want for different workflows. So we could tell it we want them to pack them like Unity would want. Unity uses specular glossiness instead of instead of metal roughness and like packs multiple properties into one texture. So it uses like the red channel, the blue channel, and the green channel for three separate black and white texture sets and combines them together to like optimize um, the texture packing, which you know reduces um, memory overhead for how big the project is. Um, Unreal Engine uh, does a different kind of packing. Um, if you're sending it to like Arnold in um, Maya, there's a different one. What we want is Blender PBR, which is set up exactly for Blender PBR. Um, if you don't have that, the other one that could be useful is just using document channels, which literally just uses the straight texture sets that we saved or that we have. So it'll literally just save out normal base color, etc., and not pack them in it anyway. But let's go ahead and use Blender PBR because it's set up for us. This dropdown will tell us exactly what it's going to save out. So it's going to save out base color, roughness, metalness, normal, height, emissive. So emission is how um, glowing bright something is. So if we had like um, headlamp lamps, if this was a car, we might have made those emissive and given them like a bright amber glowing color. But obviously we don't have that, so it won't. It'll be a black texture with nothing in it. Um, and normal OpenGL because it knows that Blender wants OpenGL textures. The other thing we can do is we can actually change the output texture size afterwards. So as I was saying, the masks in Substance Painter are really nice for doing dynamic um, changes. So I can dynamically turn on and off, like if I want to change the paint color, I can change the paint color and it will update everything automatically. Um, you can also go back and change your texture sizes. So if I want to jump down to 1024, it will just recalculate everything down to 1024. Even your hand-painted um, paint strokes on a surface, it will recalculate those down to a lower resolution or even up to a higher resolution. So I can go to 2K, I can jump up to 4K. Obviously, depending on how um, fast your computer is, will determine how quickly it can switch between texture resolutions. 4K might be pretty heavy um, for some people's computers. And the bigger the project, the more layers and more materials you have in your your um, project. Obviously, the longer it takes to process changes. Um, but I like to work at 2K and then export at 4K. Um, so I have a very fast viewport, but then I can export export higher resolutions. So let's go back to export. Set it to export for Blender 3D, Blender PBR, and let's set this to 4K just because why not? PNG, let's tell it the folder we want it to send it to. So I made a separate like texture folder I called text, and hit export, and now we just get a bar and we wait for everything to save out. Depending on your computer, this could take longer, this could take less time. This should, on my end, only take a few seconds. Do, 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 do. Almost there. Yep, export finished. And now we can tell it to open folder and it will open it in Windows for us, which is like really nice and convenient. Um, at which point we are done with substance. We can actually close it. You know, save before we close. And these are our texture sets. Perfect. And so these we're going to be bringing into Blender to then apply to our material uh, to our model. So I want to switch over to material shading so I can actually see the materials where it will give us our like shininess and everything, so we can see if our um, normal maps and our reflections and everything work. And obviously, right now we're still seeing the UV grid that we applied to the base color. What we're going to do, I'm going to switch the UV editor out to our shader editor. And so this is just a visual representation of our materials over here. So the, over here, we've just got everything laid out as like a bunch of sliders. And if I wanted to add a, a texture, I'd have to use these little drop downs, which are kind of annoying. Over here is a node view. So the base color over here, you can see is using UV test image. And that's because we have the UV test image plugged into the base color. So pretty straightforward.
So the easiest way to do this, I'm going to delete the UV test grid. You'll see that it removes it from the view. And in our folders, let's grab base color. I'm going to do these one at a time. Base color, I'm going to drag it down to Blender and drop it in. And base color is now in here. And I can click and drag from color to base color, and it will apply. And now you can see our base color is applied. None of our other textures are. It's still using the sliders for the properties, so we don't have like the other properties yet, but we'll drag the other textures in and apply our properties from Substance Painter. But so there are our colors. Move that up and out of the way. Let's grab our roughness next. Roughness, drag this into Blender, drop it. And the roughness in our color spaces, I'm going to switch from sRGB to non-color. Um, sRGB is fine for the base color because it's a color map. Roughness, because um, in Substance, obviously, we're using, or even here, we're using a slider from 0 to 1. Um, you don't want gamma applied. sRGB mode uses a gamma of 2.2, which is like a logarithmic curve for making photos, the, the colors in photos have a different dynamic range yada 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 technical details because um the roughness map it goes from zero to one linearly we want to tell the color space we're not in srgb mode we're not using a gamma curve we're just going to use non-color data it's just linear you could also send it to linear but non-color works fine so i'll drag this from the color output and plug this into roughness and now we should see that we get the same kind of patchy shiny underneath but all of the like stains and stuff we added in Substance Painter, so it's now exactly like we had it in Substance Painter. Perfect, so this is working exactly as intended so far. And the last thing we're going to do is add our normal map so we get all of the bumps and height detail that we had in Substance Painter. So let's drag uh, normal OpenGL. I'm going to drag this into Blender. And again, because this is not a color, this is not applying um, colors to the surface, this is a, a a property, I'm going to set this to non-color, and before I plug it straight into the normal, I can't plug it straight in because what Blender's expecting is it for it to be not a texture but a normal map. So I want to either go up to the top and hit add or shift A for add. I'm going to add a vector normal map node and go from color to color and then from normal to normal. And now we have a normal map applied, and you can see we get all of the bumps and height details. So we've got our chipped paint, you got the little bubbles in our paint, like the little bits of sand and stuff underneath. We've got like the rounded edges where we've got all the, the divots, the rounded indentations on the hat and on the body. And so now our material is set up and matches exactly what we had in Substance Painter. And so there we go. That is between last week and this week, we've now gone from nothing to 3D modeling a high polygon version of our fire hydrant, turning it into a low polygon one, unwrapping it, baking down the details from our other model, and then texturing it to look fairly realistic. So yeah, there we go.